I'm going to talk about a session called Writing a Java Library with Better Experience. Um, it will be made up three part, three parts. The first part is going to be about the core principles I usually abide by when I build libraries. And the second part is about some technical tips and tricks, um, which is mostly um, depending on Java language. And then the third part is um, about more about some kind of a community aspect of building libraries. So these three parts are all important. So please uh, stay on track with me. So first part is the core principles. But uh, before starting, uh, I want to introduce my projects. I want the first project is Netty Project. Um, I think you might already have heard of all, uh, Netty Project already. So it's a Java event-based uh, asynchronous um, asynchronous um, networking library, uh, which is very popular uh, because it helps you build some uh, asynchronous networking application using uh, without using NIO directly. And it now has 23,000 stars and it has 100 contributors. Uh, so if you're interested in this project, please come join in the GitHub or please follow the Netty project account. And the second project I uh, spend my most of my time recently is Armeria. Armeria is a microservice framework that's based on Netty. Uh, it, I, I've been working on this project for like uh, four to five years, uh, but, uh, and it has 2.6 thousand stars, which is much smaller than Netty, but it, also has like 111 contributors, which is pretty good. Uh, yeah, it also has its own Twitter account and GitHub repository. So if you're interested, please go there and take a look. And if you're interested, then please star us. Yep, enough marketing. Uh, so this talk is about my experience running all these two projects. So you might find something interesting from this. So for first, core principles. So the most important uh, principle I usually uh, try to abide by is to be in user's shoes. Uh, for example, whenever you build a library, it has to be, uh, you have to think uh, from your user's perspective. Uh, which means uh, if you build your library from the perspective of yourself, the, the person who implements the library, uh, it often becomes uh, less intuitive from user's point of view. So when you start writing a library, you have to think from user's standpoint. To do that, um, you do not really have to start from implementing something. Uh, you do not really need an ID. You, what, what you really need is just a notepad app or some, some simple text editor. And because you know how to write code without uh, using something complicated stuff like ID, so you just start uh, writing some example code that uses your future library, just like you uh, implemented everything already. So of course it will not uh, compile or it will not do anything, but you don't have to think much about it. Just forget how you're gonna implement about it. You just think, you just focus on uh, the actual API. And then after that, uh, you can keep refining this simple API again and again uh, by adding some additional use cases one by one. And once you are sure that your uh, 
imaginary API is ready or if you feel like your imaginary API is good enough for uh, your users to take a look or uh, start for example, if I were, you could think think like this. If I were a user, uh, how would a user think like think about this API? So if you 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 feel you, if you start to feel confident that they they are gonna like it or they are gonna find it intuitive and they are gonna find it easy to get started, then you can continue to implement something. Uh, but uh, you don't need, really need to get like uh, to you don't like you don't need to hurry too much about this. Uh, you must keep in mind that this is not a uh, 100 meter sprint, but it's like it's more like a marathon. So uh, you don't need to hurry up. And the second. Uh, most important um, everything's are all important from my perspective but uh, what's what's an, another important thing is consistency uh, whenever we uh, use some library we often think like this when what why is this like a and why is this like b so in some situation, the library behaves like this, and in some other situation, the library behaves like that. Uh, if that happens too much, we find the library is not very good. So the same applies to your library. So you have to think carefully whenever you design something in terms of consistency. Uh, for example, uh, let's say you write some builder pattern and when you write a builder pattern and you you have a setter method in there and that setter method sometimes accepts a millisecond parameter in long time and in some other cases you accept duration time this might be subtle but this kind of inconsistency adds up and then ruins the overall user experience so you have to make sure that your library api is consistent across all your api but um, if the implementation or api design is in its early stage uh, you might really not have much uh, base basis for your API design. So in that case, you might ask like, um, which, uh, which pattern should I follow? For example, should I use long or should I use duration or should I use time unit? So in that case, you're going to have to look at some other people's work if you are not confident about your design. Uh, for example, there are many language SDK, for example, JDK, Kotlin, there are many SDKs. And also there are some other popular libraries like Google's Guava and Spring Framework. And they have been very successful in the market and they often try to be consistent as possible. So you might want to take a look at how they built their API and mimic some of them if you are not sure which one is better. But what's important is that you don't really need to follow those rules blindly because some design might have been done in a different context than yours. Or sometimes the library might be a little bit too old so it was this it might have been designed in old passion so you have to think about this carefully and you don't really need to always follow blindly but uh, keep in mind that consistency is really important and another factor is cognitive load or learning curve um, so in the beginning I talked about being in users shoes right um, uh, so whenever you design a new API you start from a very simple use case 
and then add things up to build some more complex use case. The reason we do this is to reduce the cognitive load and learning curve of the API. Um, so we start from a small set of concept and then you, we build more complex solutions on top of that. That means a user can get started with a simple scenario and then learn a few small things and then do some more complex things. So it's way more, way easier to learn than just starting with many more complex um, concepts from the beginning. So to, to achieve this, you, you, we usually need to use a familiar constructs like builders and factories and decorators and strategies. Um, uh, the, all these patterns are very, very popular and it is often uh, very easy for people to follow up. And sometimes you might want to make use of some functional composition because now functional programming is uh, kind of norm these days, of course, uh, serious, not just too much serious uh, functional programming is not a mainstream, but, you know, some Lambda expressions made it way more accessible. So you need to figure out what familiar, what constructs are familiar for your audience and make use of them. But because uh, if you expose too much concepts or too much too many ideas at once, then it will be too much for a user. So you really should not try to expose too many things at once. For example, like exposing uh, ten overloaded builder methods, then. Even if IDE helps a user, a user might be confused about what uh, has to be used for his use case. So you need to be careful whenever you design an API about cognitive load. And this is re also really important. I think everything is important because, uh, yeah, and that's why I'm all talk, talking about all, all these points. Anyways, um, so uh, when, it, when people build a library, sometimes people think, think uh, its internal uh, design is really important. Yes, it is important, but it's not that important comparing to user experience. So whenever you design an API or whenever design, whenever you design a library, uh, uh, there's a moment of truth that you have to choose between user experience and internal complexity. Um, it's like trade-off. So if you, sometimes uh, it is uh, much easier or much clearer cleaner to implement a certain fi feature uh, but as a result um, the end user API becomes a little bit um, messier or it sometimes gets a little bit uh, cryptic in that case um, it means internal complex Complexity goes down while user experience also goes down, but we don't really use that um, situation. So what's important is to make sure that user experience uh, is put first, because um, user experience, good user experience, is really important for the virtuous cycle of the project. Let's say you built some bad API, and then things uh, goes to vicious cycle. For example, let's say um, there's a bad API you built, and then let's say your users are using it, and then they're probably going to be confused about it, and they, they are going to ask some questions, and they're going to report bugs, which is not actually a bug. Uh, that means a poor experience for your users, and but it also does mean that less time for development for you. 
because you have to support these confused users. That means because you're busy, your feed, you, you lose your energy to uh, give some good feedback to your users. So as a result, people might not like your project or uh, try to find some other project. And because you are so busy uh, supporting your users and you spend much less time for your development than you originally expected, you eventually get burned out. And because you don't have much time, even if you decided to fix this problem fundamentally from user standpoint, uh, the fix might not be at its best form because you're busy and your energy is low. So to avoid this problem, you have to put your user experience at the first place and then think about complexity later. And what's interesting is um, good user experience also often leads to better implementation. Uh, for example, a good API usually do encapsulation and composition really well. That means you have more freedom at implementation time and you have less complexity at implementation level. So uh, aiming for designing API for better ex user experience helps the overall implementation complexity as well. But if you have to trade off, then it's always better to choose for user experience because it helps you not to enter the bad cycle of the project. Yep, so far I talked about um, core principles. And before we dive into Java specific tips and tricks, uh, please give yes. us some questions. Okay, there's one question in the chat, uh, which is from Alex. Um, can you hear me, Simi? Yes, I see you can hear me. Yes. So, uh, uh, so what is the best way to update the API? So, for example, to fix the inconsistency. Imagine we have some methods with long parameters and some use of duration. They want to change the duration. Uh, so, uh, should I make a single commit uh, uh, just to fix it, or is better acceptable to mark something as deprecated, uh, implement a new fix APIs method partially step by step? So, what is the best way to, to evolve this API? Oh, that's a good question. Thanks, Alex. Um, so, in my experience, um, we, our team usually uh, sent a pull request that uh, adds a new method that accepts duration and then uh, deprecates the old API. So I, it's often in a single commit, but if it's not released yet, you can do it in a two different commits, but it has to be uh, something like a transaction between releases. Mm -hmm. Okay, looks wonderful. I have a question from my side as I was listening. Um, so uh, you actually, well, this experience you gained, so this is mostly gained for your work. Uh, did you actually experience some of, have experienced some of the aspects of what I told me uh, as uh, what was the biggest mistake you've made and you can share with us? Uh, according to that list of suggestions you gave us. So uh, is it, was it your experience or was it somebody else's experience? But were there any pain points uh, that really were nasty, I would say? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Well, yeah. Um, so from the early days of Netty, I tended I tended to use many abstract classes with um, public methods to let users um, extend the class and implement that abstract method. With, um, but it, it used to work pretty well because our, um, Netty was a framework, uh, but whenever, uh, but extending a class was not really a good choice for um, functional composition or encapsulation. So because of that, uh, sometimes uh, 
we had to create a new class which is final and then accept some functional uh, functions instead of letting a user extend some classes. I, I'm going to actually talk about this kind of mistakes in tips and tricks section. But yeah, that was pretty painful because uh, sometimes users had to, um, users extended it in a many different ways and we didn't really have much control over what they do with the extended met extended over the methods okay so i see that uh, sometimes you cannot predict that the user will stay in a, i would say normal uh, way of thinking and they try to extend it in a very unexpected way so you should be prepared for that as that's well right. Uh, okay yeah, that's right. thank you very much i believe we can go ahead from now <laughs> Okay, um, so the second part is uh, more about language specific tips and tricks, uh, which might interest you, although it's not everything. Yep. Um, first of all, um, I whenever when you write a library, I strongly recommend you to use Java instead of other JVM based languages. Um, because uh, if a library is not written in Java, it usually means that you require an additional, uh, often pretty huge uh, runtime dependency to your user's class path, which may be okay, which may not be okay. But uh, if you do not have much control over your users, uh, it's always better to have a smaller number of dependencies because um, some users prefer to have small number of dependencies and sometimes a user also uh, might, be, might be using some other language which is different from your language, then it becomes way more complicated. And also, um, Let's say you built your library with some other language than Java. Uh, sometimes they produce some weird synthetic classes and methods, uh, which might seem a little bit weird from Java language users' perspective. Uh, and sometimes IDE uh, has some issues with auto compilation with those classes as well. And also when you when Let's say you wrote your library using language A, and let's say calling something from language A to Java is easy, and calling from language B to Java is also easy. But calling from language A to B may not be easy, or it may be a little bit complicated. So if you write your libraries in Java, uh, because many JVM based languages almost always care about calling pure Java code. So the interoperability with between languages are pretty good. But if you write something in non Java language, it may not be that simple. So you have to keep this in mind. So what I prefer is to keep the core part of the library, at least in Java, and then provide some language specific layers on top of it. For example, you could use Kotlin DSL to uh, provide a more uh, nice way to build a certain object, for example. And if you use Scala, then you could provide some um, constructs like implicits to make the conversion much easier. But in some sometimes you might not be really good at those languages, all those languages, for example, Kotlin, Scala, Clojure, there are so many other languages in JVM ecosystem. In that case, you cannot be uh, proficient at all those languages, but you can at least good at Java, right? So 
my suggestion is to keep the core in Java and then use other people's help, uh, those who are very good at those specific languages. Then you can get together and then build something way better. And when I talk about when I when I talk about when I talked in the pre previous slides, I said some language SDK might be too big to be added for as a dependency in some users. Uh, uh, same applies to any libraries, and that's why I suggest to keep core dependencies minimal. Uh, for example, you might want to depend on some other framework to build your library, but it's, some, it, it's often not a good idea uh, because people want to you choose a different framework. Let's say you built your f library on top of a Spring framework or Juice or Dagger, and there are so many in, uh, in dependency injection uh, libraries and frameworks, right? But you, when when you choose a certain specific framework, that means uh, you give up on ad, give up the chances for attracting other users that use different dependency injection framework, for example. So what's important is to let people choose by providing integration layers. So you have to keep the core uh, small and then add some integration layers. For example, uh, integration with the Spring Boot, integration with Drop Wizard, integration with Juice, etc. So you your core is small, and then you provide additional integration modules. And of course, uh, you still have some dependencies in your core library, right? Uh, but sometimes you can hide some of them by shading. For example, some utility dependencies like Guava, Caffeine, some collection libraries like FastUtil, and concurrency utilities like JC tools, uh, they are all, uh, they can all be hidden from your public API and then you can shade them. And then you, rem then that means you remove some dependencies from your class path. But the problem with this approach is that uh, the, the resulting jar file of the core library becomes really big because you merge all these small dependencies into a big jar. So to solve this problem at our Maria project, I used ProGuard to trim unused classes. By doing this, I was able to reduce the size of the jar file from 30 megabytes to six megabytes. Um, so traditionally, ProGuard was considered to be useful for uh, Android projects, but uh, as you see, uh, it's, uh, it's also very useful for um, Java libraries as well. But before shading, you have to check the licenses of those libraries because you effectively redistribute these libraries. And this one might be a little bit controversial, but I think it's also a good practice. So go, what I suggest is to go non-null by default and not using Java lang optional type. Instead of that, you can use nullable type by using nullable annotation. Uh, the reason why I suggest this idea is because uh, a language, even if the language is JVM based, they always have uh, their own null handling mechanism. For example, Scala uses its own option type and Kotlin, it uses nullable types like I suggested. If a user likes optional type, like a Java lang optional type, they can always use optional.ofNullable method or uh, 
for Scala, they can use option constructor. So instead of returning everything in optional, uh, letting a user wrap it is more scalable because let's say um, we return the Java lang optional, that means Scala users will have to convert it into option object. Uh, that means unnecessary extra allocation. And for Kotlin users, they have to unwrap the optional object to get the actual value. So that's also a waste of energy. And, uh, and some people argue that um, Java lang that optional can be uh, removed uh, by JVM at runtime via escape analysis, but that's not always the case because JVM heuristic al uh, doesn't always uh, on your side. So I, I would suggest going no no by default. So in our Maria project, um, we define a custom annotation called no no by default. Um, this annotation uh, makes everything method, re re methods, return value, and parameters and fields all they are non null. So if you find something nullable, then you annotate them with nullable annotation. Otherwise, everything is non null. So this makes our life much easier. But the problem with null, nullness annotations like non-null and nullable are that there are no standards. So at least I found four competing, uh, maybe competing, competing or not, uh, but uh, I found four libraries. Uh, the most popular one is Java Excel annotations uh, because it's it looks and sounds like a standard, but actually it's not standard, but it's popular. But because it's not standard, but it uses uh, Java X annotations package namespace, that means uh, when you work with some other real standard packages, it might co have some conflict. So it it is sometimes incompatible with Java module system. So you have to keep that in mind. And another popular one is JetBrains annotations. Um, it's good because it has really good ID support and it also has some additional bells like contract annotation. Uh, and also there's a way more mature frameworks like checker framework but it's more more than just annotations so you might find it a little bit heavier in your use case and what's really interesting is one is um, jspecify uh, it's a joint effort to replace the java x that annotations annotation uh, but it's really in the early stage, so you, it's it's really too soon to tell what will happen to this project. So there are some trade-offs between these four choices. So it's up to you to choose what. And another tip I want to share is to validate early, and early with message. Uh, in this slide, there are two. Um, stack traces uh, they are actually the same one but the first one is uh, the exception which is raised when a user tried to set an, an invalid uh, idle timeout property when building a server and the the second uh, stack trace is actually the same but the exception is raised after uh, the property is set and the exception is raised when a build method is invoked. So the first stack trace means the exception is raised immediately as soon as a user specifies a wrong value. And the second one uh, means a user does not get any feedback when a user sets the property, but after 
only after it tries to a user tries to build the server. Um, and what's 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 also interesting is that um, the exception message. The first stack trace shows that uh, the, shows the exception message called idle timeout. And combining combined with the type of the exception, it is a self 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 explanation, uh, self explanatory, uh, which means uh, a user knows idle timeout is null, and that is not the right input. But the second one does not have any uh, message, so it is really hard to distinguish between a user mistake and a library bug. So a user might think, is this a bug in this library? It's hard to tell. This is also linked with the core principle of reducing cognitive load. Um, so whenever you raise an exception, you have to do it really quickly, and then you have to tell why it is not accepted. For example, what property is null, what parameter is null, and why this value is bad, and what is good. Uh, there are some utility methods like objects that require non null or preconditions that check argument. A preconditions class is from Google Guava, which is really useful. And I will show you some examples. Yep, this is actually an example. So I static imported preconditions dot check argument and there's a setter method called port and HTTP2 max streams per connection. For port builder method, I used require non null method to tell, uh, to check the parameter port is null or not. If not null, uh, a null pointer exception will be raised with a message telling that the port parameter is null. So it's easier to understand what was null. And then for HTTP2 max streams per connection, I used the check argument method and specified uh, some condition and then what the exception message is gonna be. And in this case, I specified what the problematic uh, property name is and then what was the bad value and what we were actually expecting. In this case, we were expecting a 32-bit unsigned integer. So that being said, it is important to have consistent exception messages. Uh, in Armeria and in Netty, uh, we use this consistent exception messages for consistent user experience. So for null point exception, we, show, we explicitly tell what parameter was null. And for illegal argument exception, we tell what was the parameter name, what was the bad value, and what was the good value. But this might not always work for your project, so you need to customize it a little bit. And But please keep in mind the messages should be consistent and meaningful. And also, I recommend using static factory methods instead of constructors uh, because it is easier to hide the implementations. Uh, if you use constructor, uh, you cannot change the implementation in the future. And uh, when you have to over overload, overload uh, many different uh, ways of construction ways of constructing an ob object, you might often see some type conflict and uh, ambiguity. So instead of using con constructor, you can use static factory method with some naming. For example, of means some kind of uh, most common use cases. And of default could return the default instance. And empty could return some 
empty collection or something like that. And because it's all static methods, you can also add some static builder factory methods there in the same class, which means static methods could be grouped together. Uh, and then a user can find uh, the methods with similar purposes more easily. And this also gives some optimization opportunity I'm going to show you. Now let's say uh, this is an example from our Maria project. So we define an interface called endpoint group, which is a set of endpoints. And when you call an empty method, then it returns a specific implementation which yields an empty set of endpoints, which is a highly optimized version. And the second one is of factory method. In this case, uh, we calculate the number of endpoints. And then if it's at zero, then we use highly optimized one. And if it's only one, then you can just return the first one as it is. Only when it's more than two, more than one, we use some composite endpoint group, which is less performant, but uh, more versatile. So you have more freedom with implementation details by using static factory methods. And the other tip I would suggest is to avoid inner classes. Uh, some people prefer using uh, inner classes, especially for builders, but I really wouldn't recommend it because uh, people usually uh, use IDE, auto completion. In that case, uh, the outer class name is omitted, like the example in this slide, a builder, builder equals same some class dot builder. So in that case, who's it is a little bit hard to recognize whose builder is it, who, whose builder it is. And another problem is what happens if we import other class dot builder? Um, so in that case, you usually you cannot import other class dot builder, but just other class, and then you have to specify like other class dot builder later when you declare a builder. So this kind of in user code inconsistency uh, makes user code less beautiful. And sometimes a user have to unimport the first builder and specify the outer class name again. And also I'd say it is pretty developer centric to organize the builder implementation in the same class using inner class. Um, it's a little bit, it might be a little bit cumbersome, but I would suggest defining a separate builder class, like some class builder uh, for better user experience. And the, the complexity incurred by this is not that big. And when you build a library, uh, you really need to avoid code generators, especially in public API. Uh, for example, uh, tools like Lumbo is sometimes okay for generating internal classes, but uh, it's not always that good uh, because public API requires a lot more human touch. For example, uh, even a simple getter or setter method needs a handcrafted Java doc and handcrafted validation and just like that. And also it helps, uh, it lowers the contribution barrier because a user has to configure uh, their build plugin or ID plugin just because of code generation. And it sometimes doesn't work as expected. So here's a here's an here's an example from again our Maria of our handcrafted setter in action. So in this case, we put some Java doll uh, that details what it does and what value is correct and what value is not correct, and when this method should be used. And we also do some additional validation in actual code.
and there's always backward compatibility issues in that case uh, I, I recommend following semantic versioning uh, semantic versioning is uh, a complicated topic to cover in this uh, presentation but the core concept is that it's three digit uh, system which is made of major version and minor version and micro version so when you bump a major version you break uh, backward compatibility and when you bump the minor version you usually add new features and when you bump the micro version you usually do only bug fixes and nothing else uh, of course it's not very easy to follow the semantic versioning scheme strictly so to cover up uh, I recommend experimenting as much as possible in uh, 0 0.x point y days uh, that means because when a major version is zero it means uh, you can make uh, breaking changes uh, uh, without bumping the major version and to help following or tracking uh, breaking changes you might want to use some automated tools like JDIF and another tip is to keep the public API to minimum I I talked about this a little bit about uh, in the Q&A session for the per first part uh, so you ne really need to think twice before adding public or protected method so uh, you need to use static factory methods in interface and hide the most implementations uh, and some but sometimes uh, it is not easy to hide public or protected methods because uh, as the project grows its complexity uh, sometimes some common constructs are required to be hosted in somewhere else in that case it has to be a public class in Java in that case you often need you you, you can move those classes into some special packages named like internal by doing that uh, it can be hidden or deprioritized by tools at least uh, for example you could exclude all packages whose name contains internal or you could blacklist those classes in IDE so why keep everything uh, why try why try not adding public API uh, the reason is that um, API change often requires a major bump and people really do not like breaking changes so by hiding implementation chain details uh, uh, you have more freedom changing some internal behavior while uh, maintaining backward compatibility At the same concept, uh, you really need to make your classes and methods final. Instead of allowing people to extend the classes, uh, it is way better to provide some functional composition, like accepting uh, functional classes, functional interfaces like function, consumer, and predicate. The reason is a user sometimes or quite often makes a mistake like forgetting to call super or doing something completely unexpected in the protected methods <clears throat> it's also a good balance between user experience and developer experience in my opinion but uh, before uh, but uh, sometimes you really need to remove final uh, for a good reason and at that in that case you really need to discuss and think a lot uh, because it can be opening a can of worms and if uh, some implementation a limitation uh, exists then users can actually uh, often fork some problematic class instead of extending it and then modify some part of it and after 
uh, later, you could think about redesigning it and doing some major version bump. Uh, because it is not per, uh, people, we are not perfect. Uh, sometimes we may not be sure that this is stable enough. So in that case, we use some stability annotations. Um, there are many stability annotations in the wild, like beta, unstable API, internal API, maturity level. There are even libraries for that. For example, Apache Yetus audience annotations and API Guardian. Um, so, do some review and do some research and choose whatever you want, and but do not overuse it because let's say you are at 1.0 but you put this unstable API annotation on everything then this is not really 1.0, right? So you do not really have to use it as an excuse for instability. And of course, there are some usual engineering tips like using immutability and two string has to be implemented properly. Javadoc should be awesome. You have to keep your code clean and automation. Yeah, all those usual um, engineering um, principles should be maintained at top notch. So you do not really, you really should not forget about this too. Yep, we have 19 minutes, so let's have some oh, yes. quick question session. Yes, so we just have one quick question. session. By the way, I'm just giving my vote in the chat uh, about, so this talk is pretty awesome, and I'm really happy to share it with everybody. So um, I would like to ask a question from Danila. <laughs> Uh, okay, so if your main language is actually not Java, like for example, uh, what about library written in Kotlin when all microservices are written in Kotlin? It's an internal library. So it's one language specific, I would say. Is it a better idea to implement it in Java or just switch to Kotlin and that's it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, if your entire ecosystem is in Kotlin, I think it will be okay to use Kotlin as a main language for your library. Uh, uh, the reason I talked about using Java as a primary language is because of my experience is that uh, my users are not always an internal users uh, with uniform environment. My users are sometimes Java user, sometimes Scala user. In that case, you are going to have to use Java. But if you are certain that uh, your users are internal users and you only target the users, uh, only target Kotlin users, then I think it's fine to use Kotlin as a primary language. Lovely. And that's one question from my side as well. So you mentioned the tool called ProGuard, which like eliminates um, unused classes and builds like a, a more compact, um, you know, set up uh, for, for the framework. But uh, have you actually tried all this recent stuff that started from Java 9 uh, to allow you to build your own very tiny set of uh, classes and even the JDK you need to run all this stuff. So have you already tried it? Um, are you are you talking about JLink? Yes, for example, yes, JLink. Huh. Um, I think it only shrinks the size of um, JDK but not the library itself. So I think they are different comparisons like apples to oranges. So mm -hmm. not exactly, yes. It's just from another right, from, right. from another side, I would say. Okay. Uh, right, right. so uh, I guess we can uh, continue. Thank you. We have okay. Okay, I only have 16 minutes, but this part is really important. The biggest thing I want to emphasize is not give up. So when you build something, something really awesome, but people, whenever people sees it, uh, 
not always everyone picks it up. That's natural thing. Let's say you just open sourced it and you just opened it to your colleagues, but uh, you cannot expect everyone to use it for their projects overnight because it's new stuff. So you have to keep trying. So it usually takes a long time. Uh, it's not a matter of days or months, but it's actually matters a matter of years. So you really should not give up, even if it does not uh, get features get featured in uh, Y Combinator overnight. It really takes time. So it's you. You'd better think about think it as a journey and the, during the journey you have to dog food the library and keep improving it because otherwise people are not going to use it for example then you're going to check uh, the library has activity for example if there are no releases or comments or site updates in the last six months and then they will think that the library is dead and you have to be careful not to uh, leave your test coverage low. For example, let's say the test coverage is only 20% or there is actually not any test coverage, then people are not use it, are, are not going to use it. And, and of course, documentation is important, but this does not mean that you have to write a book about it. But you, at least you should provide something good enough to get started, like tutorials and some uh, case specific examples and you have to set up some place to chat informally uh, this is really important for example you could use slack or gitter uh, because you need some kind of interaction between people uh, and when you interact with people like potential users uh, because although you are doing all your job all your work for build, building library and they are using it but you have to keep them in mind you have to respect them and appreciate appreciate that they are in the community even if they are not using it yet and of course you have to assume that everyone is not good at textual communication so when you chat about something people might might not be good at explaining something then you have to accept that and be patient and because uh, the project is at the early stage you have to think every single visitor is really important um, because to be your first customer or first colleague in the market so because of this, you have to engage really actively. Uh, for example, let's say some people, some guy came to the Slack channel and then described some kind of weird bug he found, but he might not be good at explaining it. But eventually you got what was the bug about, then you might just want to let him create an issue for you because that's the usual process when you solve a bug but uh, in this case how about creating a new issue for him and add some detail add some detailed report to it instead of letting the visitor create a new issue this helps a lot of time especially for those who are not good at textual communication and it also helps you to understand the problem more uh, in detail Oh, so they are usually going to be very happy because when you do the job, like creating a new issue for them, and they are often be happy to provide more feedback, or sometimes they sometimes even send a pull request for you. So it's good. It's it's important to get some uh, provide some good experience in terms of both library code and both in the community people to people interaction so this is one of the example i had recently uh, tobias is uh one of the community member he was using uh, armeria and netty uh, yeah i was asking about something and he, he answered and i 
thanking him for uh, providing some additional information. Then he, what he said is, it's weird uh, that I'm using a product that I wrote, and now Tobias is asking for features that um, some other people who are not actually related are implementing, and they and Tobias did not pay anything but just a little bit of pay, for praise and recognition. And then I'm thanking him again. So this is this might look a little bit funny and weird from the first look, but this brings some positive feedback uh, between the community members and it, it eventually helps people communicating with each other. So to do this, to make this happen, you you really should not be happy, uh, should not be shy, but ask questions. For example, how did the user found us? Or what feature do you like about us? And what is missing? What feature could be added or improved? And are you using it? Or if not, what could help you to use us? And sometimes, uh, as I said in the previous slide, I could create some issue for you, and then you could tell, uh, and then and make 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 the user happier, and then you could ask for more feedback, or you could even ask them to consider sending some pull request. And this uh, this works really well, so you really need to be kind to people and be patient. So usual soft skill works here, like thanking them and assuming good faith. And even if they say something bad about the library, it's not about you, but it's about the library design or some something not you. So you really do not need to take it personally. And sometimes there's some kind of conflict between each other, then you sometimes need to agree to disagree in, in, instead of uh, discussing way to hit it. And of course, emojis and GIFs are really useful for interaction between people. So don't be shy and just use those um, emojis. They are very useful. But uh, because you have to deal with many people as project uh, grows up, uh, it is likely that you are interrupted really often. So you need to take some balance and be careful not to be burnt out. And another thing I'd like to recommend is to have a website, a dedicated website. Uh, for example, uh, in many cases, people tend to uh, be okay with just having readme.md file, but readme.md file is not always good because it's not beautiful and uh, it doesn't give you enough room for uh, some advertising. Uh, for example, if you go to github.com and browser repository, uh, it first shows the list of files and directories, and at the end of the list, you show the readme file so people need to scroll down to see the readme file and sometimes people will not scroll that much and uh, github.com is not always mobile friendly as you know so and because github.com is not your website you cannot do some you cannot do any traffic analysis it had some insight menu with the traffic analysis, of course, but it's very limited, and you can do way more than that by using other analysis tools like uh, Google Analytics. So find some site generator that works well for you. For example, for our Maria, I used Gatsby, and there are also other um, site generator projects like Hugo, Spinks, Jekyll. So choose the one and try to build something good. And here's the proof. Um, by updating from one site to the other site with some nice landing page, I was able to get some 
40% uh, increase in the visit visitor numbers and number of sessions were almost up by 50% and bounce rate and session duration has been improved as well. So, but, but to do this kind of measurement, you all have to build a website first. So it's important to have a website to learn how your users are visiting your website. And because you have some numbers now, you have refer logs, which means uh, you figure out uh, what visitors are coming from where. So you, you know who wrote about us or who is using us. So if, once you find some use, useful uh, refer URL, then you can you can think about contacting them uh, so you can engage like asking more questions like I said before or you could update the community resource pages to add some additional resources and you could also tweet about it so this is there are two examples I want to show the first one is some unknown guy the guy unknown to me uh, talked about the ultimate micro framework smackdown and he introduced Ormeria in his presentation and he explained some pros and cons about it uh, but he did not contact me directly but because I found his talk via a referral log, a referral log I was able to um, reach him via Twitter directly and Gossamit was able to get some additional feedback. And I also found an interesting project that uses Armeria. So I was I tweeted about it and I got contacted by the original author of the project and I was able to start chatting with him. This is a good experience and it also motivates you really well. And the last point is to prepare a good developer guide. Every user of a library are actually a developer. So today's user can be tomorrow's developer in a library world. So spend your time for good onboarding experience like build, build requirements and how to build and how to set up with IDE and what the coding convention is and if he, your project is open source, you also need to prepare tools, prepare uh, some legal stuff like contributor license agreement. Uh, there's actually an open source and free service for managing this. So you might want to take a look at it. And if you're looking for a good example of a developer guide, please go to this Armeria uh, developer guide URL. And if you have more time, uh, think about speaking in a conference. Uh, speaking in a conference is a good way to advertise your projects and connect with people who are interested in new technology. So this is a good opportunity. And if you have some energy, consider hosting contributor events like open source coding sprint. Um, uh, if Sometimes it might be a little bit hard to do host such events um, in public. In that case, try organizing this with your colleagues at your company first. This will work way better than working with arbitrary people in public. And if you're interested in this talk, um, you could watch and learn from how I, how I and we do by visiting our repositories. And these days I spend my most time on our Maria project. So if you're interested, interested, just come and talk to us. Yep, so last marketing stuff is that um, if you are interested in microservices, um, please visit armarian.dev and you'll find some good uh, open sourcing good 
good resources about open sourcing libraries. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yay. Thank you so, so much, uh, Trusted. Uh, at least I've made a lot of notices for me. What should I do on my, uh, on my internal projects <laughs> as well? <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, by the way, uh, Maxim also joined us. Nice to see you. Okay, uh, so I would say that uh, from um, we are strictly on time, which is amazing. Thank you so much for doing this for us. And I think that from now on, uh, we will go to the uh, discussion zone. And um, there we will continue. So once again, don't be shy. You can ask questions in Russian. We are here to translate them and to translate them back as well. So um, don't be shy. Thank you so much, Trustin. See you in the discussion Thank you zone. for attending my talk. Yeah, thank see you very you. much, everyone. Uh, see you there. Bye-bye.